Uh, I need uh, post-it some pipe cleaners if you find them. I don't know if you're going to those kind of stores. I need cereal. Um, I need, let's see, cherry tomatoes, kale, um, a vino lotion. don't have a lot of anything. I got two carrots <laughs> and some beets. So I need, yeah, real, I, I sort of need all that vegetable-y stuff. And, and blueberries. Blueberries, yeah. But I have some bread and... Oh, okay, we'll see you, we'll see you real soon. Every day I choose what I'm going to do in the light because I only have I can only do it for so long any given time before I start to burn. I have more stuff than I need. Pencils. I love drawing. Uh, it's like my it's like a, my window a window into a, you know time in the light. sketch of where it's going. I'm not sure if I'm going to do the hat or not. It's a sketch of this photograph. This is Ira, uh, and th these are his partners, Doug and Terry. I'm going to take this, and I've been drawing drawing it out and I'm gonna try drawing it in circles and see what happens. So that's the goal. I mean, when I first started drawing the circles on my wall, I was having a, I don't know what you'd call it, uh, I had started a drug called mexilatine, which is uh, uh, the pill form of lidocaine, to see if they could stop the, some of the pain in my face. Uh, Lyrica, another drug, had stopped the, the pain response from my neck down, which was great. So they were looking for another drug for the face. And, but that one made me nuts. It just made me mentally unable to stop thinking negatively. And so I was only on that drug for a couple of months and I went off it and took another couple months and I realized I needed to call the VA for help because I was becoming more, I didn't feel like I was suicidal, but I was more suicidal than I thought I should be. And uh, so I started, uh, started that process with the VA. It, it brought up a lot of stuff from Vietnam and from my childhood the, that uh, I couldn't get away from. I just couldn't. These things light up, so they're, put the bags over them so I can hold them. I just started therapy uh, th three or four weeks ago uh, with a trauma therapist and in my first appointment, he introduced me to this, uh, a box he had, a little electronic gadget that uh, you can turn on and it, it vibrates. Uh, and you, you hold two, two round uh, things that are connected to the box and they both vibrate and uh, 
They're, they're wonderful. They keep you in the present so that y you don't get lost in the stories that you're telling. Like my mother told me that a story that I had walked in on my dad stomping on her and breaking her ribs at a certain point. I was about six or seven, she said. And I don't remember seeing that. But I know that I chewed my fingernails till they bled. And I didn't know why. But I also knew I loved my dad. She said I saved her life. She said my dad was trying to kill her at that point. Who was that? That, I believe, my dear, is Tarzan. So Tarzan and Hercules were some of the father figures I went to that were on TV at the time. There's almost always in, in that uh, mythology or genre, a, uh, there's often a boy or a young man that uh, Tarzan or Hercules or, you know, the muscle guy has taken under his wing and he's going out into the world and, uh, but he's often got a, somebody he's protecting. Just found this in a box uh, the other day. There, there are photographs from some of the things from when I was modeling. I had a window washing business for you know most of my life, and that was uh, modeling was sort of something that was fun on the side and completely different. My wife got me into this. She kept telling me to. I was cuter for her than, than the guys she was seeing in the magazine, so she told me to be a model. And I don't know. She threw away all my white underwear and socks and bought me all colored underwear and socks and and uh, she got me thinking about fashion. I was pretty boring, I guess. So I came out when I was around thirty. Um, and I had two kids, uh, four and one. It was a process with my wife working out uh, how we would split up. And uh, it was tough because we both, we loved each other. And uh, it was a painful experience, but our choice was to live together a celibate life. Uh, and raise the kids and just not think about sex. And I, did, I felt like that would be setting myself up for failure. We used to go down to the adult bookstore and, and you know, buy whatever we, we both wanted. And, uh, okay. and in that area, one day when I was there without her, I met a guy who wanted to have sex with me and made that plain. And, and I was attracted to him, and I said I, I would, I was interested, and would he come home and meet my wife first? Because that's sort of the deal we had. And he said yes. So, I drove him up to the house and introduced him to my wife, and told her that you know I'd be back later, and uh, went off and was uh, parked in front of the guy's house and. I said, you know, I, I haven't really done this before. Uh, I, I don't know if this is going to work. And he took his finger and rubbed it on my lips and said, well, and I said, oh, I, I think this might work. It just, it was like electricity. It was amazing. Uh, my wife and I hadn't had sex for quite a while, uh, some years, since, since Corey was born, I think. But the next month, we did, and we made Brie, and that was the last time we had sex again. Jason coming in. 
You know, Jason and I dated uh, for about four years. Uh, we're uh, still friends. We're not dating anymore, but he still brings me food. There you go. Hey. Now, do you know how to check this out? I have no clue. I've never. Oh, shit. We have such a great time, but he's a lot younger than me. He's uh, now he's, I think he's 41. And he and I got on really well, and he could live in the dark with me here really well. He was here a lot. Thanks for talking. Thank you. Well, I'll call you. I'll call you then from open hand. Okay. All right. Bye. CJ. You need some money? Uh, oh, yeah. How that much? would be nice. Uh, but I can't go out and meet his friends. I can't go. You know, so ultimately, after a couple of years, it's hard when your partner can't, doesn't know any of your friends. You know, and your life is going on outside still, but there's this, it's an interesting thing. I'm a sort of a stuck-in-time-like person in here. I met Ira one day at the Country Western Bar, which was called the Rawhide back then. And he was dressed in full leather because he was only there for a little bit. He was going to go over to a leather bar, the Eagle. And uh, I saw him across the room and, and, and sort of had a, had a response. And he looked at me. And so we ended up walking and meeting in the middle somewhere after talking with him for a while, I remember thinking I didn't want to just think about him uh, sexually. He was interesting and fun to talk to, so we set up a date and uh, started seeing each other. He hadn't been tested. He didn't know if he was positive or not, but I could tell by you know hugging him and, and just feeling him. His lymph nodes were swollen and he was probably positive. And it took me a long time to convince him to get tested. You have to remember his partner had just died of AIDS too. So he, you know, he, it wasn't just, you know, he was worried about that. He had been through the whole shebang. They had been together for 20 years. He's one of the guys in the, uh, in the leather jacket. He's the first leather jacket up there. And then Terry is the second and Ira is the third. The microscope is totally fun for watching things, you know, anywhere where dust lands turns into a bacteria garden. Oh, this is so easy to get lost in. I'm a gardener. I love gardening, and I've not been able to garden that much since I've been in here. This is a rosewood box of a, of a friend of mine who died quite a while ago. He had uh, HIV. Um, he's, uh, his name was Ken Leeds. He's the one that uh, left me his piano. your magic, spread your poison, keep this body alive, work your magic, spread your poison, keep this body alive, to breathe the sunshine in, feel moonlight on my skin. Touch your heart of gold to watch my I don't think I've processed all of the things that happened in those that that decade, sort of the nineties. I mean it started in the eighties, but the the mass die off was for me really it happened in the late eighties and nineties. Spread its poison, keep this body alive. Work its magic, spread its poison, keep this body alive. To breathe the sunshine in. Feel moonlight on my skin. Touch your 
let your heart go to watch my kids grow. Magic potion for curing me. You're the poison killing me. Kill me day by day. I'm dying to live and stay this way. It happened so fast and it was like an ocean wave that just kept rolling and in and in and in. And so you never really got time to recuperate from uh, one amazing person after another dying young. It was worse for me than Vietnam. A different kind of war and death. But uh, definitely the uh, same kind of feeling. I remember thinking that uh, more than once. I'm a medicine man. I'm here because of medicine, can I? I'm a medicine man. Yeah, this is a Ira died in 94, and we were together for about five years. I was out looking for morphine for him and came back, and uh, his mother was there, had been with him when he died, and she looked to me and said, I'm sorry I treated him so awfully this last week. I just didn't want him to feel like I approved of his life. And, you know, I'm sorry I, I hurt you, but uh, I, I don't agree with your lifestyle. It's interesting, the, it's, it's not about one circle, it's about, you know, a million messy circles turning into something else. I like the cellular idea the building up of something. There's a feeling about that in, in uh, I have the idea in my head that I'm gonna cover my whole ceiling and walls with circles. So I'm gonna touch every square inch of space. And that is a nice feeling for me for some reason. Uh, when you start uh, working on pain and you're covering the pain up, it's, you know, you're creating like an oyster, a pearl, with that little grain of sand that's irritating it and they cover it up with some, a substance to make it uh, not hurt. And that's kind of what this is, covering up my whole space. But I think a lot of things we do are one kind of pearling or another, trying to stop pain. You know, we humans take drugs since forever and each culture has drugs that are they consider okay and drugs that they put people in jail for. Every now and then, I will, you know, walk around a corner from this part of my room to that or walk back in from the front of the house and uh, think, oh my God, my life is weird, just totally crazy. And then other times, you know, I've, it's, I've figured out ways to normalize it, and it, it doesn't feel that weird. What I live on here, I have a feeling of hope that I will get out of here. But th uh, that feeling of hope also carries me. If I don't get out, you know, I don't get out. I've lived enough lives and recreated myself enough times. I. I think I get amazed at life and the crazy things that happen to humans, but it's, if this is, you know, gonna be my life, I can do this.
your magic, spread your poison, keep this body alive. Work your magic, spread your poison, keep this body alive.